minute. Uh, uh, one minute. <coughs> 54 seconds. You got this. All right. I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. You, you okay. I'm going to read the title first, and then I'll pause, and then I'll read the paper. I'm always afraid I'm going to find like a typo and be like, oh. when you're done or no, and I know you don't have a problem with this, but make sure you enunciate. Oh, I will. I, I've read this now twice. Talk to the wall. By myself. 30 seconds. All right, yes. Uh, after I'm done, you can, I'll say questions, and then you can ask. Let's try to limit it to Seven. three, Max. I, 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 no, no one might have any questions. I'm not supposed to ask the question. You know, you're good. Wait, why is she good now? Because I decided I didn't like that question. Oh, very nice. Ten seconds. <laughs> Nine, eight, seven, I'm ready six, five, get four, three, two, and one. Okay. Uh, I dreamed a dream, ekphrasis and dreams for both Virgil's Aeneas and Cicero's Scipio. Quite often in Latin literature, ekphrasis is associated with the act of dreaming. Ekphrasis itself is a very broad term that subsumes various forms of rendering visual objects into words. In two works of Latin literature, Cicero's Somnium Scipionis, as well as Virgil's Aeneid, Ekphrases abound. With the Aeneid, the particular focus is Book VI, where Aeneas and the Sibyl are in the underworld. In both these works, dreams are associated with Ekphrases. In this paper, I will create a connection of comparison between Ekphrases <coughs> and dreaming, as well as dreams' ability to be used as both a didactic message and motivating source for the protagonist of these two works. One dream world will have us looking forward at the greatness of things to come, while the other will project our gaze into the greatness of the past. The dreams in both Cicero's and Virgil's works will serve as a didactic message for our characters, which will propel them to bring about their intended fate. It first may prove pertinent to begin with a working definition of ekphrasis for our own use. For the purposes of this paper, ekphrasis shall be defined as it was with the prognomasta, a sophist manual of style, which is a vivid description of places, persons, or things whose purpose is to invoke or animate the object in order to persuade the listeners or readers that they are in its presence. Dreams provide image, and image provides realization of purpose. For Scipio and Aeneas, their purpose is realized in the non-factual world, or what we might call their dream world state. Though Aeneas is in the underworld, and it could therefore technically be argued that he does not exist within a dream, it is through the gates of sleep that both he and the Sibyl must exit in order to return to the living world. Aeneas realizes his life's purpose and his fate in the underworld, and the visual stimulation which he sees, as Scipio did, <coughs> moves him to carry out the task he must perform. For Aeneas, that's finding the Trojans a new home. For Scipio, by virtue of visually seeing the world as it truly appears, and the great men that once walked it, he is moved to live his life and exercise his soul in the most noble of activities, so that his soul may attain everlasting rest with those other illustrious men. These dream world for our characters are the catalysts which launch them into understanding their fate. For Aeneas, the sight of his future descendants is his channel, whereas for Scipio, it is his past descendants that drive him forward. The dreams and visions of both are the motivating spring for each man. Taking a deeper look into the first of these true dream worlds, it would likely prove best to begin with Aeneas and his vision of Rome's future descendants and her greatness. It is the visions of, in the dreamscape of the underworld that truly shows Aeneas his intended fate. Aeneas is being toured through this macabre world with the Sibyl and his father Anchises as the guide. His father is showing him the greatness that is to follow Aeneas' completion of bringing the Trojan race to the land of Latium. Aeneas' entire experience in the underworld, everything he sees, everything he hears, every emotion he feels, is an ekphrasis that has been amalgamated with the actual existence of the dreaming experience. The idea of Aeneas in the underworld, considered as dreamlike in nature, is the base for our original ekphrasis. It is this world that he visually sees, which is visually rendered into words, so that we, as the readers, can also see this world. However, it often seems that in the underworld, Virgil has Aeneas slip into another ekphrasis within the dream that we're already in, thereby creating ekphrasis within ekphrasis. 
When Aeneas sees the souls standing at the banks of the river Lethe, he asks his father, why are they preparing to go to the world above, only to return to dull bodies? Alias ac caelum hinc ire putandum et sublimis animas iterumque ad tarda rerenti corpora. It is with Anchises' response that we go into another exorcist when we are already in one. Anchises begins to describe heaven and earth, its creation of beasts and men, the feelings they will feel, and the purging which must go on before the souls return to the bodies that go up to earth. Anchises says to Aeneas, In the beginning, a spirit within them nourishes the sky and the earth, the watery plains, the shining orb of the moon, and titan star, and mind flowing through matter, vivifies the whole mass and mingles with its vast frame. From it come the species of man and beast and winged lice, and the monsters the sea contains beneath its marbled waves. So, Aeneas, they are scourged by torments and pay the price for their former sins. Some are hung, stretched out to hollow winds. The taint of wickedness is cleansed for others in vast gulfs or burned away with fire. Spirit suffers, each spirit suffers its own. Then we are sent through wide Elysium, and we few stay in the joyous fields for a length of days till the cycle of time completed removes the hardened stain and leaves pure thorough thought and the brightness of natural air. It is Anchises' description of the process of souls returning to earth and the creation of it that we have ekphrasis within ekphrasis. Aeneas is already seeing that which does not yet exist in the living world, but now Anchises shows us another part of that already non-existence. He then begins to display the characters that Aeneas and the Sibyl see, and the greatness that is associated with each of them. This is the dreamscape within the dream, the actual existence of Aeneas and the Sibyl with the non-existence around them. With Anchises directing Aeneas' gaze to his future descendants, we again enter another ekphrasis within ekphrasis. The characters that Anchises is displaying, being that they only exist in the underworld are not, and not yet the living world above, again give credence to the dream world in which Aeneas finds himself. With each new future descendant and that Anchises points out, he begins with a word that possesses some sort of a visual connotation. In the next example, the word that Anchises uses is wides, that is you see. Virgil's word choice for Anchises is pointing out where he wants Aeneas' gaze to be directed, while simultaneously, therefore, pointing our eyes in the correct direction as well. Anchises says to Aeneas, Aeneas, see that boy who leans on a headless spear? He is fated to hold a place nearest the light, first to rise to the upper air, sharing Italian blood. Silvius of Alban name, your last-born son, who your wife, Lavinia, late in her old age, will give birth to in the woods and become a king and father of kings. It is through him that our race will rule Alba Longa. With Anchises' words, we see Silvius in great detail. We are able to fashion him in our mind, leaning upon a headless spear. The shade of Silvius that Aeneas sees, the realization that his own descendants makes further advances for rousing him to Latin shores. The unwritten history of his people serves as a fire and motivating fuel. And Pisces continues describing person after person, each accompanied by his own visual perception. But perhaps one of the most truly incredible visions that Anchises shows to Aeneas, and one which truly creates another ekphrasis within our already dreamscape world, is that of Caesar Augustus. Not only does the sight of Augustus come with a vision, but with a didactic message of what he will do, namely usher in a new golden age and expand the power of Rome. This didactic message that is brought by the scene Augustus, like all other future descendants, commits Aeneas to not only despair of hope, but to make him realize that the men he is viewing will one day come into existence, that Rome will be found and built, and that finally the remnants of the Trojan people will one day again rise in glory, and moreover, it is all because of Aeneas himself that these things will be brought about. Aeneas' experience in the underworld, in this dream world, has allowed him to view the enormity of responsibility that rests upon his shoulders. It has permitted him to truly cast aside his fears and doubts. In a sense, it has directed his gaze to the history that his people, the future Romans, will make. Aeneas' glance is forward, facing into the future, whereas Scipio's glance and the greatness that he beholds, as well as the ideals and feelings that he takes away from his dream world, will have us looking into the past. Cicero's Somnium Scipionis comes down to us in his work, De Republica, 
about the Republic. The Somnium begins with Scipio Aemilianus dining at the house of Massinissa, a prince in Africa that is attached to Scipio's family. The connection being that Scipio's great-grandfather, whose name is Scipio Africanus, earned his surname by defeating the Carthaginian general Hannibal at the Battle of Zama. During dinner, Massinissa can talk of nothing else but Scipio Africanus and his great deeds and maxims. After dinner, Scipio Emilianus retires to bed, and this is where his dream world, our exorcist, begins. At the very beginning of his dream world, Scipio Emilianus recalls to us that men have often in their dreams made manifest their thoughts and conversations. Uh, as Cicero writes, our thoughts and conversations give birth and sleep to some such fancy as that which Aeneas records about Homer, of whom, to be sure, in his waking moments he was wont to think and talk of very often. So to light for Aeneas, now Emilianus has made manifest the visions of his great-grandfather, no doubt stemming from the constant conversation of Africanus at dinner. The appearance of Africanus is our first visual experience within Emilianus's exorcist. Africanus's words to Emilianus are to banish his fears and record what he says. We cannot help but to immediately make a connection with Anchises and Aeneas, Anchises has banished the fear and dread from Aeneas' heart and has instructed him, via the visions of future descendants, to realize what is to come. Much like Anchises' directional guidance, creating an ekphrasis within ekphrasis, Emilianus' dream world is created further by Africanus and so deepens our already entered upon dream world. He points to Carthage, a city forced by arms to be obedient to Rome. Carthage, like Silvius or Caesar Augustus, is shown to us as the readers. Then the history of the city, much like the history of personages shown to Aeneas, is revealed to Aemilianus. Africanus begins by saying, Now he, Africanus, was showing to me Carthage from a place on high, full of stars and bright and shining. Uh, Africanus says, That city, Aemilianus, which is reviving the recollection of wars of old, cannot rest in peace to attack uh, you almost now as a private soldier. Within these two years, Emilianus, you will destroy it as consul, and that title, which so far you bear as an inheritance from me, shall be won for you by your own achievements. But when you have raged Carthage to the ground, celebrated the triumph, held the office of censor, and traveled on a mission over Egypt, Syria, Asia Minor, and Greece, you will be elected consul a second time, though abroad, and you will bring a most important war to a close. You will utterly destroy Numantia. These are the future visions that Scipio Africanus is showing to his great-grandson in order to give him a didactic message. The visions of future achievements will be the instructive impetus by which Emilianus will become the man that he is to become. The conversation between Africanus and Emilianus continues to develop, where yet another vision is shown to Emilianus, that of his own father, Paulus. Emilianus embraces his father with, with tears and then asks, why he must linger on earth, and why he cannot simply hasten to join him. It is Pallas' response that is almost the antithesis given by Aeneas from Anchises, given to Aeneas by Anchises, rather. When Aeneas asks why the soul, souls are crowding around the banks of the river Lethe, this is the opposite response that Scipio Africanus gives to Emilianus. Africanus says, it is not, Pallas says, it is not as you think. For unless that God, to whom all of this region, you can, what you see, belongs, has released you from the keeping of your body, the entrance to this place cannot be opened for you. For men were created to subject this law, to keep to that globe what you see in the center of this region, which is called the earth. And to them a soul was given, formed from these everlasting fires, which you mortals call constellations and stars. That round, spherical in form, alive with divine intelligence, complete their orbits and circle with marvelous swiftness. Scipio asked why he must linger on earth if real life is here in the stars. Aeneas also asked Anchises why any spirits would go from the underworld to the world above, returning to dull matter. The two parallels between Scipio Emilianus and Aeneas in this matter are incredible to imagine. <coughs> on the one side, we have Virgil, regarded by many scholars as the main authoritative author of Latin poetry. On the other side, we have Cicero, equally regarded by scholars as the authoritative figure of Latin prose. Both authors have created two men in worlds of the non-factual, seeing factual entities of men that have either lived or will live. Scipio Africanus, like Anchises, also states that men's souls have been formed from everlasting fires. Anchises tells us that the power of the soul of men comes from a fiery seed. 
The dream worlds of both the heavens and the underworld provide us with the imagery of a fiery beginnings of men. Aeneas' and Scipio's guides in their dream world have now become our guides, who are showing for us an image both in the beginnings of where our soul will start and where it will end. Cicero and Virgil have visually written dream frames that both their protagonists and we their readers behold. Finally, Africanus' display of all that Emiliana sees is incredibly comparable to Anchises' visual presentation of Aeneas' descendants and the overall dreamlike state of the underworld. Aeneas' fears were banished and his fate and destiny cemented by seeing his future descendants. Emilianus has not yet seen his past descendants, but has not only seen his past descendants, but also the world in which men's souls will one day inhabit if they live a virtuous life. It is the words of Scipio Africanus, accompanied by the visual perception of Emilianus, that transfixes his mind to the determination of one day inhabiting this world. So you should not have lost hope of returning to this place, on whom great and illustrious men rest all their hopes. What then is your human glory worth, which can hardly affect a scanty portion of a single year, said Africanus to Emilianus. He continues on by saying, Therefore, if you will choose to look aloft and fix your gaze on this resting place and our eternal home, nor enslave yourself to the rumors of gossip, nor stake the hope of your life on the rewards of men, virtue must be drawn you by her own attraction to true glory. What others say of you, let that be their own concern, but still they will talk. However, all that talk of theirs is both confined within those narrow bounds which you can see and has never been of long continuance in the case of any. It is buried within men themselves and ends in the forgetfulness of posterity. Africanus' words and images provide for Emilianus the didactic motivator he needs in order to firmly secure his desire to both complete his life in a noble manner and to complete noble deeds and achievements, therefore not being forgotten by posterity. In summary, we can compare the ecstasies that Aeneas sees and his entire experience with Scipio's experience. We have Scipio, who has entered a dream and is shown the world that exists and the world that exists beyond the knowledge of Rome. Scipio has shown his ancestors that have lived and the great things that they have done and have attained on earth. Aeneas is the opposite of Scipio in that Aeneas is seeing the world that is yet to be, as well as his ancestors that have not yet lived. Both Scipio and Aeneas are told of a code of life or fate that they must attain in order to achieve greatness. For Aeneas, he must reach the shores of Latium, and Scipio must live a virtuous life. For both men, we have the actual existence blended with that of the dream experience. The visual experience of the dream world has given this message to both men. It provided for them the visual catalyst that equally served as a didactic motivator in their lives. Cicero and, Vir Cicero and Virgil created the illustrated dream world for both their characters and so for us. It was a vivid description of places, persons, or things that invoked us, that invoked objects in us in order to persuade us, the readers, that we were in its presence. Like Aeneas and Scipio, we have awoken from our dream and departed, recalling in our mind the scene images. Questions? Oh, yes, cameraman, Mr. Annan. <laughs> what is an exorcist? Right, so an exorcist is art within art. Um, so as I was telling... Uh, them earlier, you can have two forms of ekphrasis. You can have uh, a narrative mode of ekphrasis, which is, for example, when Aeneas uh, goes into the underworld and everything he sees is is not real life. That's why I'm saying it's, it's dreamlike, um, and so it, it's just it's basically art within within the story, within the context. Um, another example of narrative mode would be in the Iliad, for example when Homer writes about the shield of Achilles. And on the shield of Achilles, the whole creation of the universe is depicted. You have the, you have the universe, you have the moon, you have the earth, and then you go down deeper, and within the earth you have people, pastures, uh, two cities, uh, one at war, one at peace. Um, and so that shield is telling us a story uh, within the art. Uh, so that would be a narrative mode of exorcism. And then pictorial mode would be as if I had a, uh, a Greek vase, for example, that displayed a story with on it. And you or I, as the viewer of that Greek vase, would see it, uh, and we would read the story uh, that is on it, but the story is displayed in art form. So that would be, that would be your exorcism.
Oh, Mitchell. Yes. Ah. Ah. Well, I'm not sure if you've mentioned or if you mentioned this in the uh, paper, but did the person who wrote the story of Scipio, did he write, was it the same person who wrote the Aeneid? Right, right, no. So Cicero, I didn't mention. So Cicero wrote uh, the story of Scipio. It's called the Somnium Scipio, it's the Dream of Scipio. Whereas, you remember in Latin 1, Virgil wrote the story of Aeneid. Did he know that, that, did he know that like, that his story was going to be like the complete opposite, like the mirror of Scipio? No, of course he would. Well, Virgil that? and Cicero um, live around the same time. Uh, but I, I think most likely, I don't know if it's fair to say that Cicero would have ever, I don't know, looked at the Aeneid and said, oh, look, Aeneas has seen the future descendants where my character Scipio has seen the past descendants. Their characters live two separate times apart, right? Uh, uh, Aeneas lives, we could say, around 1200 BC. Uh, uh, we're, we're close thereafter, because uh, that's when the wedding of um, Helen and uh, Paris take place in Troy. Um, whereas Scipio lives at least 1,000 or 500 years after. So the two characters in their story are different. The authors of those two stories lived at the same time, um, but it's doubtful that Cicero, in my opinion, probably would, or maybe, maybe, maybe it's not so doubtful, but I don't know if, he, if Cicero ever thought, hmm, Aeneas is looking forward and my character is looking backwards. So that's a good question. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much for your time today.